Hi everybody, Dr. Pedro, I'm back with Dr. Sarah. Hello. Hi there. Nice to see you. So, <laughs> so uh, today is Broccoli Day, and uh, we have uh, some interesting data that's come through from a study that I know uh, you're excited to pick apart and, and get into. And uh, we've been talking about broccoli on and off for a long time here, so we figure we'll roll up our sleeves and, uh, and really get into the, the science behind it. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. I mean, I love that this is going to take us to Johns Hopkins. It's, you know, one of those schools that I think has mythical qualities, right? It's <laughs> sort of considered so rigorous. And I, I love that we've got broccoli and Johns Hopkins in the same sentence. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, 10 years ago, I don't know if that would have been the case, uh, you know, and, and 20 years ago, for sure not. But, you know, now it's, it's what's being studied, you know, food, let thy food be thy medicine. And uh, uh, there's all kinds of stuff happening uh, in very reputable institutions right now talking about uh, what these foods are, are potentially doing uh, and uh, where their kind of health benefits are. And, and the part that always gets me is, you know, they'll go and they'll do these studies and then all of a sudden uh, scratch their heads and say, wow, I'm really amazed at how well that worked, <laughs> right? Like, turns I know. out. Right. Like and so way, this, this one. works better than a pharmaceutical. Who knew? Yeah. 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 Hippocrates knew about this, right? Let food be thy medicine, let medicine be thy food. Yeah, and that's, you know, we, we can kind of get into a little bit of that as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the education had been shifted or, or let's just say influenced by uh, pharmaceutical interests who said, hey, you know what, um, we got all these young, smart people coming out of medical school, and if we could just kind of tell them about our drugs and, and, and have them recommend them, um, it might be good for business. And so that model we can see kind of collapsing in front of us in a lot of ways. And a lot of very serious good doctors are going back to saying, well, let's start with the basics. What are you eating? And, and what could that do for you? That's right. And good riddance to that whole idea that you've got to find the answer to health in the bottom of a prescription pill bottle. And on the one hand, I think it can be life-saving, right? I mean, we all want antibiotics for the life-threatening infection. We all want certain pharmaceuticals when necessary. It's just that they're overused and we need to get back to the basics That's as right. we are today. That's right. That's right. And so I wanted to just note something as I'm looking at the study. It was in 1992. So guys, I said 10 years ago we weren't talking about this. These guys are rocking this stuff in 1992. So, go Hopkins, go Hopkins. Yeah, that's right. Hopkins Hopkins <laughs> got it figured out, right? And so it's this has been years and years of work that, you know, they've been kind of following up on and all of a sudden, you know, when you hear people saying you should eat broccoli, know that it's usually because years and years of research has gone in and has really kind of shifted the dynamics of, of how we're talking about it now. So I say we, uh, we roll up our sleeves and geek out for a minute and, uh, you know, just kind of talk about the, the, the big points on this thing and, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into what that means in real politique in the grocery store. Sounds good. Yep. Start that revolution with your grocery cart. Let's do this. All right. Yes. I love it. So 1992, uh, they started doing uh, Talale. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Do you know how to pronounce the name? Uh, so let's just, let's just call him, uh, don't we know his first name? Talala? Talala. I, I can't say it. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to butcher the poor person's name, but let's just call him T. T, Dr. T. <laughs> So they started looking at uh, brassica. It's it's basically a plant genus commonly known as the mustard family, and it, it includes, uh, in addition, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, cauliflower, and turnips, all the yummy stuff that you loved eating as a child, right? <laughs> right. So. Not, right? I mean, we know that some people have that taste for the bitter qualities of these cruciferous vegetables, these brassica, and they... It just tastes horrible in their mouth. I happen not to have that gene, the bitter gene. My husband does. So he, you know, he can't even stand the smell of these things getting mm. cooked. Mm. So we're a little different. You know, this is that era of personalized medicine. Some of us really love these types of vegetables mm. and others are just like, stay away. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're a stay away type of person, then uh, there's lots of extracts. There's lots of interesting stuff that is happening now where, you know, okay, so we're finding some of the very specific chemicals that, that you know, they've actually dubbed as chemo protection chemicals uh, that um, are, are being found in these foods. And so we could take them and concentrate, you know, make extracts and take those as pills, which, hey, look, it, it works. So if you can't choke down the broccoli, take the pills for sure. Uh, if you can eat it, you know, 
I'm, I'm a big fan of the whole food thing, as I know you are too, uh, because look, then you're getting all the fiber, you're getting, you're getting the soluble fiber, you're getting the water, um, and you're basically getting the satiety on something that's really low calorie, uh, high bang for your buck. Uh, you know, no, I, I don't think I know anyone who's getting fat off of broccoli, right? That's right. And you know, Pedram, I'm just going to throw this in here. We got to talk about uh, Dr. T in a moment, but we had a question from one of our listeners, a physician who was listening to us and asking about estrogen metabolism in the context of our conversation about Angelina Jolie. And we did talk about estrogen metabolism in that conversation. In fact, we talked about cruciferous vegetables, how they do more good than harm when it comes to your thyroid. And I think this whole idea of goitrogenic effects are you know, maybe overstated. There's not a lot of great science behind it. And then we do know that this extract in particular, diindolmethane dim, helps to create a more favorable estrogen pathway in your body so that you make more of the good protective estrogens and fewer of the ones that are more likely to cause harm in the body, that are more tumorigenic. So I just wanted to add that there is a time and a place for these extracts. Yes, we think it's a good idea to get the fiber and to get the whole food, but you have to eat about 25 pounds of broccoli to get the equivalent of what's in a dose of diindolmethane that I happen to use. Yeah, exactly. And and food-based green medicine is this huge movement right now and and people are looking at, you know, taking the the good from these foods and and basically capacitating it, not messing with it, not tweaking it, but taking the good thing and and, and giving you that in in higher dose to get the benefits that we want. And again, guys, if if you're going to your physician saying, hey, I want to try these things, and they're shaking their head saying, I don't know what you're talking about, then you might want to, you know, either bring literature to them or say, look, you know, there's other docs in town because there's a lot of evidence coming out in this space uh, and have been coming. I mean, look, this, this study is 1992, right? There's a lot of stuff coming out that's pointing to all this and these functional docs that are out there uh, basically, you know, on the on the razor's edge and, and, and close close to, uh, they're really changing people's lives by using natural forms of medicine that are, are getting the results and are proven by labs day in and day out in clinics all over the country. You got that right. You know, if you want to read more just about methane. I talk about it quite a bit in my book, The Hormone Cure, so you can pick up a copy of that. It's in the chapter on excess estrogens. Fantastic. Yes, and that's, uh, you'd be surprised, you wouldn't be surprised, one would be surprised how much that is uh, in effect in our modern world, right? I mean, estrogenic soaps, estrogenic, you know, co compounds in all of our foods, uh, you know, take, if, if, if you're not careful with taking, you know, soy and things that are like estrogen modulators, I mean, there's estrogen everywhere. And, uh, you know, unless we are properly metabolizing hormones, properly moving stuff through, uh, we're going to have problems. And, uh, you know, you talk about a lot of those things in your book, and I really appreciate it. I've actually recommended your book to probably 80% of the female patients coming through our clinics just saying, just read this. You know, someone finally put this in an English for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, I and another important point here, the microbiome, you know, the set of genetic material that is in the bacteria in your gut has gotten a lot of attention recently, and we're going to do a future session on this. But I think it's important to also mention that with the rise of the paleo movement, sort of back to protein and vegetables as a basic food plan, people are eating more red meat. And we know that red meat actually changes the microbiome, and it also raises your estrogen levels. So I think that this kind of baseline issue that we have with a high level of estrogen dominance for women who are 35 and older may be getting a little worse with paleo. So it's just something to think mm. about as we talk about the cruciferous vegetables, mm. the brassica family. Interesting. You know, you know what's interesting about that, and I'm, I'm going to take a quick sidestep with you there, and, and we'll, we'll kind of dance back to the middle here, is uh, I was just talking to a doctor who's uh, doing a lot of research on this, and what he was saying was, look, even the fruits and vegetables and the things that we're eating today look so different than anything that was available back in the paleo days that it's, it's not even fair to compare because, you know, you'd get a, a, a banana that'd be mostly seeds and be this big. You'd get, you know, a, a carrot that would be mostly fiber and root. So these guys were working a, a lot of fiber in their diet, taking a lot of bulk, eating vegetables that we can't even recognize today. And, and guess what? It wasn't like you were clubbing a deer and having, you know, big, uh, you know, ribeye steaks every day in those days. I mean, meat was a, was a treat. Right, and, and so uh, there, there has been some emphasis on you know, you know, being oh, I'm paleo, so I'm gonna you know, 
bang my chest and, and, and eat steak every day, that's not really consistent with how often these guys had, had fresh, you know, meat to eat. And so, um, you know, I think the, if you keep the emphasis more on the vegetable side and, and you could have the lean meats, the paleo starts to make a lot more sense based on some of the, the, the literature I've been reading. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's hard to compare apples to apples when basically everything that we know, as, know of as food has been cultivated and prepared over thousands of years to, to yield more sugar for us, yield more, more, you know, carbohydrate for us. You got it. I mean, a perfect example of this is corn. Mm. You no, know, it used to be that the corn that our paleo ancestors ate was um, very dense. It was not sweet. It was multicolored. And now I'm from Maryland, right? That's where I was born and raised. Maryland sweet corn, it's white. It's super sweet. It's got a high glycemic index. It's very different from what our paleo ancestors were eating. So totally on board with this. In fact, what I call myself, I'm really an agnostic when it comes to food plans because I think we all have to figure out what works for us. I would call the way I eat, I'm a paleo vegan. I'm a vegan first. Like I really eat my vegetables. I stay away from dairy and then I, I throw in my meat as a condiment. But we're totally getting off topic. We're supposed to be talking about broccoli and sprouts here. Okay, how, how's this for a hook? <laughs> so when we look at this, um, this broccoli extract, one of the things, I'll pull us back into digestion here because I found this to be uh, particularly interesting. Uh, uh, when they started, some Japanese researchers started uh, looking at the link between broccoli and H. pylori, which is you know, uh, almost epidemic proportions here in the West. I mean, everyone's got these these proton pump inhibitors and, and taking antacids and all and taking antibiotics for, for, for their ulcers. H. pylori is kind of the culprit in that ulcerative universe of, you know, uh, American, you know, hot dogs and beer and, and I don't know why my stomach hurts world. Um, and so... GMOs and GMOs, another future topic. Yes, absolutely. And I think we should bring Jeffrey Smith in as a guest uh, f for a, a show there because uh, he's got a lot to say about that subject. But, um, okay, Okay, this is a small study, 20 individuals, but they had a significant decrease in H. pylori infections uh, with a diet rich in bro broccoli sprouts. And, and here's the point that I want to make is, you know, because you'd mentioned very astutely that, you know, you got to eat 20 pounds of broccoli to, um, to be able to get certain effects with, say, the dim and all this kind of stuff. What they're looking at in this study are actually the organic broccoli sprouts. And um, I'm just going to take a pause here and we're going to put in a picture. This is what they look like, guys. Okay, broccoli sprouts. So, they're so cute. Yeah, <laughs> they're so cute, and they're delicious, and and they're really really good for you. So, what do you say, Sarah? You want to jump into just the the, the enzymes and what, what these guys talked about in the uh, in the study? You want me to read it, or you want to get into it? Uh, guide me a little here. Okay, okay. So <laughs> here, I'll I'll just go. I'll, I got distracted by how cute the sprouts are. I started <laughs> to think about you know this time in my life ten years ago when I bought a sprouter and I was sprouting all these vegetables, including broccoli. And what happened to that sprouter? I don't think it made the most recent move. Uh -oh. So that's where. So you you keep going. You went you you went off on a Buddhist dilemma, right? <laughs> Thought exactly. trains. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so chemo protection. What is that? What's it doing? And why have uh, you know what? What are these substances? Okay, so we're talking about sulforaphane uh, glucose, glucosinolate, uh, which has some cancer-fighting uh, properties that they're finding in the pungent brassica, uh, brassica family, right? And so. Uh, basically, they fed extracts. First, they start with rats, of course, right? 20 female rats, five days, expose them to a group uh, at, that basically had a very active uh, carcinogen. Uh, my goodness, I don't even try to pronounce that. Dimethyl benzothracine, right? So something that's really bad for them, right? And the rats that received the extract developed fewer tumors, and those that did get the tumors had smaller growths that took longer to develop. Okay, and so what they're finding is that sulforaphane is a very potent promoter of phase two enzymes. And and uh, broccoli contains unusually high levels of uh, glucorophanin, which is basically natural, uh, naturally occurring precursor to this substance. Okay, and so then uh, then they started getting into the sprouts, which have uh, basically a particular sequence of anti-cancer uh, elements, uh, and. Uh, Basically, although it has a lower nutritional content, the sulforaphane in the sprouts is like much higher. And uh, basically, what one of the best parts of the, about this is, is 72 hours later, you're still getting the antioxidant effects, which are significantly longer than vitamin C, E, and beta carotene, while still, uh, you know, while still boosting the effectiveness of some of these vitamins. So, I mean, just just at first glance, it's like, yeah, nice, Bro broccoli wins. 
That's right. You know, thank you for doing the heavy lifting on describing the data because this, these are terms that um, even we have a difficult time <laughs> pronouncing. And um, I think, you know, the take home message to me is that you are amplifying the innate intelligence of the body by using the Brassica family, especially the sprouts. It's just a very potent promoter of the detoxification and the antioxidant effect in your body. Now, I think we should translate that into some plain English. So how do you talk about antioxidants, Pedro? How do you describe that to people in a way that they can understand? Because once you start talking about redox, I think most people are just like, la, 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 let me check Facebook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, I, I guess I'm the go-to metaphor guy here. Uh, <laughs> one, yes, you are. One, one of the ways I like to talk to people about antioxidants is, you know, cops on the beat. Right, you you've got. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why is it that we always have like the end of the endocrine disruptors or the prisoners? And okay, keep going. Yeah, that. exactly. It's it's the martial <laughs> art. It's the martial artist in me. It's a it's a defensive stance, right? But you know, you got all kinds of things that are going wrong, right? And you know, you you have riots potentially going off in your body, and you got people that are cruising around, keeping the order, keeping the peace, right? And so these antioxidants, basically, you know, when you have oxidative stress, basically, you know, oxygen is wonderful if you breathe it. Um, when you got free floating oxygen in the system, it starts messing around, and you know, without getting into too much kind of biochem or, or ochem, basically, it's you you don't want a negative charge substance um, that bouncing around and, and it, creating other kind of cascade effects in your system, right? And so these substances, what we call the antioxidants, will bind the bad guys and help balance out these cascades of, it's, it's almost like a, a, a pinball reaction, right? And so once you have a, an activity that, that's creating this oxidative stress, it starts to kind of spread until you can stop it. This is actually an interesting conversation I'd like us to have with, say, Clint Ober uh, and some of these guys that are doing this earthing stuff, because to me, I found it particularly oh, yeah. interesting to have free-flowing electrons binding the protons uh, and, and kind of neutralizing the system, right? And, and so, what these substances are doing is helping offset the damage that's coming from A, life, uh, and B, toxins, uh, you know, most specifically because there's a lot of things that will create oxidative damage in the body. And, and really functioning as, really, the, if you think about it, this is the stuff we used to eat. So we develop symbiotically with our environment and we had these things in our diet all the time and they were just kind of part of our relationship with earth and environment and food and everything. And uh, until you know, a few hundred years ago, it, was, it, it wasn't even in question, right? Then we start, or maybe a few thousand years ago, we started cultivating certain crops and avoiding that stuff. And now it's kind of gotten to the point where food is in a box, food doesn't look like food anymore. And a lot of these things that we would take for granted as a hunter-gatherer um, that would just be in our diet and be available to our cells are no longer there. Mm. Fantastic. So I'm just going to recap your analogy because you, um, you did such a lovely job there. So just super simple, the antioxidants, the broccoli sprouts are acting like good cops in your body, right? They're on a beat, cops on a beat. So I really love that idea. They're kind of getting rid of the bad stuff in your body, which we need. It's just something that all of us generate. The other thing that these broccoli sprouts are doing is they're working on phase two of your detox pathway in your liver. And I think this is so important because our detoxification system in our body, in our liver, gets overwhelmed, especially in women of a certain age, 35 plus. The same system that detoxifies in your liver also deals with the endocrine disruptors, also deals with estrogen, by the way, which is relevant for both men and women. So we want to keep supporting these detox systems. And this is one of the ways to do it. Broccoli sprouts, who knew? You can get them from your health food store. You can yeah. get them from Whole Foods. You can get them from, I think my local market, you know, my little corner market that is a mile from my house has them. Yeah, yeah, and it's not hard. I mean, broccoli isn't that esoteric of a compound. It's easy to get a hold of. And check this out. Just one ounce of broccoli sprouts contains more of this sulforaphane than two pounds of broccoli. Woo! Okay, Amazing. so this stuff is potent. Yeah. That's it's, good for estrogen metabolism, my friends. That's right. And, and you know, and I really like the idea of sprouting yourself. I mean, you know, call me an old hippie or something. But, you know, if you could sprout <laughs> old food. Hippie. Old hippie. Yeah, old young hippie, somewhere in between, right? Um, but it's, there's something very magical about preparing stuff 
at home, you know, letting the kids get involved with it, you know, just being able to harvest your own stuff and know, you know the goodness that's coming from it. So if you have an opportunity to sprout it on your own, wonderful, get a sprouter, do the stuff at home. If not, grocery store will be happy to sell it to you. Um, and, and that's really, you know, kind of that kind of you vote with your dollars bit too, right? They're also happy to sell you a box of, of you know, sugar cereal. They don't care what they're selling you as so long as they're selling you something, right? So if you start buying good stuff from them, they start stocking more good stuff. And so, you know, again, we're trying to encourage people to, you know, really vote with their dollars and buy good good produce from the stores, which will then, you know, it's, it's really just economics. Then it creates a market. Then they know they have customers. Then they could go put in the purchases and bring more broccoli sprouts to us, and we all win. That's right. Vote with your dollars and also spread the word. You know, share this video with your friends. Send it to eight friends that you really care about. You know, maybe you know that they need to detoxify. They need to get a good cop on the beat. They need their broccoli sprout. So share this because this will give them the why that allows them to step into the grace of better health, better wellness, better vitality. Absolutely. Amen to that. Yeah, guys. I mean, the, the greatest gift you could give people is a gift of health. And, and health comes through knowledge and self-empowerment first. Okay, and so today health is coming in a green color. It's broccoli colored. <laughs> and so, you know, one of the things I want to definitely talk about, you know, is this ability to prevent cancer. Um, and basically the indole 3 uh, carbonyl, which is a powerful, uh, base, basically it's a powerful antioxidant. It's stuff we were talking about has anti-carcinogenic properties that are also present in, in broccoli. And so it's a, it helps in the hindering of the development of prostate, cervical, and breast cancer. While also, you know, what you talked about, the, the phase two uh, detox, uh, improving the liver health, right? And so how does something, you know, a lot of people would say that. It's like, how can something be good for everything? And it's like, well, you know what? I, you know, ask, ask the guy above. You know, nature is amazing in that capacity. There are foods that are just good because they... Uh, they're, they're full spectrum. They allow for multiple systems to be enhanced. And remember, your body has its own innate healing capacity. These foods are really helping unlock DNA sequences to allow for that to happen in, in an epigenetic capacity. They're also giving you the phytonutrients and the things that you need to, uh, you know, allow the body to have what it needs to really, you know, recruit the cops and get the cops mm -hmm. out there. Yeah, excellent point. And I, you know, one of the things we're talking about here is nutrient density. I'm going to pull out a little Joel Furman here and talk about how we want to eat foods that really have a high nutrient density. I was giving the example earlier of the Maryland sweet corn and how it's so completely different from what our ancestors ate. Same thing with many other vegetables that we eat. You know, if you buy some of your vegetables from maybe a big box grocery store, they are probably not going to be the same nutrient density as the vegetables that you get from your local organic farmer. So we want to be thinking about this. And here we have an example of broccoli sprouts where the nutrient density is high even compared to broccoli. So we want to be eating these foods. We want high nutrient density. I just thought I would do a little homage to Joel Furman here. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel. So, yeah, guys, and it's obviously easy to get. Uh, broccoli, actually, for those of you who've gardened, uh, is pretty easy to grow, too. I mean, you can do the sprouts. You can do the broccoli itself. Again, um, the reasons why you would do that, I, I would probably do both. The sprouts are great. Um, you know, and, and if you're a shake person, it's easy. Just, you know, cut some sprouts, chuck them in your shake in the morning and go. I also like fully grown broccoli uh, because of the added fiber and the added, you know, kind of bulk. If you are someone who has a problem with satiety, if you are someone who says, you know, say wants to lose 10, 15 pounds, um, you know, you can eat a lot of broccoli, like I said, feel filled up, have good health benefits, and then, you know, not make certain bad food decisions because you're, you're, you're full and you feel pretty good, right? And uh, what's, what's one of the major uh, symptoms that people complain about going to the doctor today too is constipation. Right. It's it's just a it's, you know, a real big problem in, in patient populations around the country and so and around the world, really Western world. Um, and, you know, a lot of that has to do with fiber and hydration um, and uh, broccoli has fiber and water. This is our cue to drink. A yeah, sip. exactly. All right. Water time out. Everyone out there to take a sip. <laughs> drink some water. Yeah. Such an important point, Pedro. And I, I think. You know, when you come home from a busy day at work and you've got those jungle drums sort of telling you to eat the crap instead of eating the good stuff, that's a great place to make a smoothie. So you maybe throw in your broccoli sprouts together with the rest of the smoothie that you like to make. 
I encourage people to make a smoothie ideally in something that extracts nutrients and doesn't get rid of the fiber. So I love to use my Vitamix or Nutribullet, throw in the broccoli, throw in the broccoli sprouts together with, I like it with vanilla and uh, maybe a little maca. That's what I do when I come home from work, when I'm a little jangly, like mm. a little crazy pants, mm. and I'm starting to think that chocolate and a glass of wine sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you wait maybe another 15 minutes, it will be a good idea until it becomes a bad idea, right? And that's, <laughs> and that's really the point, is if I'm hungry enough, I could eat this desk, and I'll wake up burping going, uh-oh, right? And, and so you gotta be two steps ahead of your, your sugar cravings by understanding that you are getting hungry and you're going to start making different kinds of decisions. Um, this is actually a point, um, I, we've gotten a few questions from people on this. And you guys, we welcome questions. So, you know, wherever you're seeing this, just put in the comment thread, you know, you know they'll get it to us and we'll try to answer them within the next show or two. Uh, but people keep saying, oh, well, what, what's a good smoothie recipe? And I said, sure, I could give you nine different books, uh, you know, cookbooks from different friends of ours who are all doing wonderful recipes for this, that, and the other. But uh, I, I, and I'm going to ask you what yours is in a second. But here's my answer to that is whatever you got that's in the kitchen that's fresh, chuck it in, right? And, and, and so I'm a big CSA guy. Okay, um, we we love community support agriculture. What we do is basically you, know, you get this bucket of stuff every week or two that comes in from local sourced from local organic farms. You know, for us it's in Southern California. They have them all over, right? So if you if you're wondering what I'm talking about, just stop and Google CSA, you know, community support agriculture, and and they'll just you know there's a pickup spot or some places bring it to your house, uh, and you just get a bunch of stuff in there. And a lot of times people say I don't even know what that is, and they'll have little like tutorials and say, well this is a beet and this is why you you know would want want to eat it and whatever. Um, but for me, it's like fresh produce, seasonal and locally grown. So, you know, I'll just go to the bucket and just pick a few things and chuck them in the blender or chuck them in the Nutribullet or the blender or whatever it is I'm doing that day with maybe a coconut milk, uh, you know, a, a protein powder. I'll either do Vega or hemp or, or, or something of the sort. Um, and you just got to see if you have any cross reactivity. So I don't like to say, well, eat hemp because of this, because some people don't tolerate it well. Right. Um, uh, so I use, I usually use a vegetable based protein and and um, I don't really even sweeten it because the vegetables and stuff I put in there are fine. You know, what, what do you do? Well, I, I do similar things. I'm a working mom, so my situation is that when I get my CSA, in fact, I, I get it Tuesday night, so I just got it this morning. And uh, what I do is I take the greens out because the greens are my top priority. They're the backbone of the food that I eat. And I slice them. So I typically will get kale or chard or collard greens and I'll slice them pretty thin and stick them in the freezer. So they're in a bag in the freezer and I can just grab a handful of it and make smoothies using that. Mm. What I, I happen to love chocolate. So what I do, I've actually got a little canister right here so I'm going to show it. Nice. So I, I made a vegetable source of a protein powder. That's a little example here. And um, I do the protein powder. I happen to love chocolate, so I'll do chocolate, and I figured out exactly how many greens I can put in there with some fiber so that I don't taste the greens. You know what I mean? I'm kind of masking it with the chocolate. So I happen to be a chocoholic, and this is one of the ways I get my fix with chocolate, using a really nourishing blend. So chocolate, my greens, filtered water, and then I add in some fiber because we know that we need about 40 to 50 grams mm -hmm. of fiber a day. Most of us are getting only a mm -hmm. fraction of that. Mm -hmm. That's how I make my smoothies. And I also make them in the morning. Like I'll make them on Sunday, put them in a container with a little shaker in it. Mm -hmm. And then I have it stocked in the fridge so that when I'm feeling jangly and low in blood sugar and I'm starting to make some bad choices, I'll take it out of the fridge, shake it up and drink it. Fantastic. That, that you guys, is probably one of the most important take-home messages that you're going to get from anything you hear is have it ready, right? Del Taco has it ready for you. McDonald's <laughs> has it ready for you, right? And that's the, the urge, right, is like, oh, my God, I'm hungry. And, and it's like predictably it's noon. I can't believe I'm hungry, right? But so, so just plan ahead, have it ready, and you'll find that you're making good food decisions the whole way through, and you're making guilt-free ones. Um, yes, on that point, by the way, guys, sorry, I forgot. Um, I soak chia seeds when I, get up, when I get up to go run the dogs in the morning. I'll soak some chia seeds. By the time I come back, I'm ready to go. I'll chuck the soaked chia seeds into my, uh, my smoothie as well, and that's where I get a lot of my kind of soluble fiber and all that. So, yeah, fiber. Fiber is a big one, um, and thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a big chia seed fan. Um, I, I 
find that I, I like the flavor and that gooey fiber seems to have all kinds of good health benefits that we keep reading about. It's magical. Yeah, I do three tablespoons. I'm like big into fiber, big into chia. Mm. I take three tablespoons measured dry, soak them in water, and then they're ready for you in five to ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's quick. And I've had people say that, oh, I soak them overnight. You don't really need to. You know, five, ten, fifteen minutes. Um, it's, you know, as soon as they, kind of, as soon as you can start to see that goo around them, it's, it's good to go. The re- you know, the rest of it'll happen while it's going through you, and it'll do. And it has that kind of broom-like effect. It'll start just clearing things out through the GI tract. So, um, and as does broccoli in a lot of ways. So, um, I just want to hit a couple bullet points on this um, because our friend broccoli is getting a little lonely there again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you just tossed out the broom-like effect. I like that metaphor too. All right, cool. See, I, I'm uh, again. I get to be the metaphor man. Yeah. So, let's see. Prevents cancer. Uh, rich in the glucorophanin, which can uh, basically can be processed by the human body into kind of compatible uh, into a compound compatible with preventing cancer. Uh, we talked about the H. pylori. Uh, it's good for the nervous system. Has a high potassium content. Uh, uh, it regulates blood sugar because uh, the possible you know basically magnesium, calcium, uh, and potassium in the broccoli. Uh, blood blood pressure. Sorry, I said sugar. Blood pressure. Uh, uh, effectively reducing cholesterol because of all the soluble fiber, which is proven. If, uh, proven to be effective in such a thing. Uh, and it's just a great addition to the diet for the reasons that I, I kind of keep harping on is, you know, I look, I like to eat, man. Um, I really do. And if you, you know, if you grow, grown up Middle Eastern and stuff too, they'll put a lot of rice in front of you and just, you know, look at you like you're crazy or you've offended them if you don't finish your plate. So, you know, old habits die hard. So I'll just, I'll have a big plate of vegetables with broccoli and stuff like that. And I'll be full. I'll be good. And um, it's really, I mean, three, four, five hundred calories. Uh, in, you're really stuffing yourself um, mm-hmm. with broccoli. And, and it's good. So have a protein source, have some lettuce, have some kind of mixed colored greens greens and it's a great addition to a diet. Love it. Love it. You know, I want to add one other little anecdote here, Pedram, and that is I was talking to a cancer researcher who lives in the Midwest who said to me, you know, I really believe that sugar is evil. Sugar is feeding cancer. Mm. And what he eats primarily is vegetables. I mean, we keep talking about this over and over again, but I just want to emphasize this point. You know, much of the research we're talking about today reinforces what this cancer researcher is saying. There was another study that I think we didn't mention yet, which is where they they took a hundred individuals and they gave them broccoli sprouts and they compared them to a hundred individuals that were given placebo and they found that those who got the broccoli sprouts were um, very low in a particular chemical that causes DNA damage. So this is part of that link to cancer that we're talking about, but The answer here is um, broccoli sprouts, having more vegetables, that's really the theme song. Yeah, and guys, don't read this the wrong way. If you have stage four cancer, you're not just taking broccoli uh, to cure yourself of the disease. I mean, look, it ain't gonna hurt to have plenty of vegetables in your life, but you know, what we're talking about is prevention and a lifestyle um, that can offset this stuff, you know, because I'll, I'll get, you know, once in a while we'll get comments saying, how can you say broccoli cures cancer? It's like, that is not what we're saying. What we're saying is it has anti-cancer fighting uh, capacity. And so if you're eating broccoli every day and living the right lifestyle, not, you know, breathing out of a, a diesel pipe, uh, chances are you're going to have better chances of not developing these things. And that's really what it is. I mean, it's just about calculation of risk and, and, and hedging your bet with lifestyle because, look, cancer's out there. Right, um, it's 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 doing what it's doing, and so what we need to do is live a lifestyle that's most conducive to offsetting these things and these risks that are that are out there and, and increasing in freak, you know, increasing in magnitude, if you would, uh, for everyone who lives in the Western world. I'd say anyone who lives on this planet at this point. You got it. I mean, the last point I would make here is we want to create a good neighborhood. We're not talking about you know the cure all for cancer. We're talking about creating a good neighborhood. And one of the key ways to set up a good neighborhood is with your broccoli sprouts. So get some broccoli sprouts today. That's right. Dr. Sarah, always a pleasure. Um, I hope that we can inspire some people to talk about uh, getting some more broccoli on their table. Um, you guys uh, keep sending questions. We'll, uh, we'll kind of weave them in as we go. And uh, I think we're going to be talking about um, gut health and the body. Yes, I, I know what you want to talk about next week. <laughs> All right, we're going to go there then. So we're going to talk about basically the biodome and what it means to have healthy gut flora. Um, and that's kind of a continuation of, of this H. pylori conversation and, and then really getting into what good gut health means. So that's what we'll talk about next time. 
Sounds great, Petram. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.